Hello, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on organic synthesis, NMR and chromatography. Now this video is dedicated for the AQA specification. So everything in this video um, is specifically for you if you are studying AQA um, A-level chemistry. So it's not like but you might find other resources where they're quite generic and you're wondering if they are actually in the specification. Well, this video is actually dedicated to AQA, so is um, so is perfect for you. And in fact, there's loads of these types of videos. These with the black screens are revision videos, so they cover the content directly for this exam board. Um, there's year one and year two uh, revision um, videos on Allery Chemistry YouTube channel. There's also um, some uh, whiteboard tutorials as well going through some generic information and on top of that um, there's some exam paper walkthrough as well so it's quite a comprehensive range of videos uh, on allery chemistry and um, they're all for free um, all I ask is you hit the subscribe button and that would be absolutely fantastic just to show you support and you get any updates as well uh, and basically as long as people keep subscribing and watching then I'll keep making the videos um, so like I say this um, this video here is dedicated to AQA as you can see there so um, therefore it meets these specification points and this is the, the kind of running order for this video where we're going to look at organic synthesis first then we're going to look at nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy or NMR and then towards the end of the video we're then going to look at chromatography so um, there's three elements to this um, there's a lot of information in this video um, obviously NMR is quite tough in its own right and then you've got all the organic reactions as well which we're going to look at so uh, so yes there is quite a bit of information in um, in this video anyway okay so let's look at um some organic synthesis first okay so they, we're going to look at aliphatic now the best thing um the best thing about aliphatic or uh, organic synthesis is or this topic is it puts all of the organic reactions that you've seen already and it puts them all into uh, into one place now you need to know the reaction mechanisms from here okay so you need to know uh, what 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 do we need to react with one chemical to form another etc and so therefore we've got some different chemicals on here now, I think good idea for this, because there's a lot of information here, and, and the key thing with organic synthesis is just being able to um, kind of practice and practice and practice over time, um, because there's a lot of information here. So I'm not expecting you to watch this and say, oh, I know all these, and if you are, then you're superhuman. Um, but all this information here is really, you should learn it over time. And you've seen it already. There's nothing new here. This is just summarizing all the different reactions that we've seen. So what I thought would be a good idea is if we take... Um, all of this, uh, all of these different chemicals here, and I'm going to release the arrow, so where it's going from, where it's going to. And what you can do is pause the video, okay? Um, have a think about what reagents or react conditions that you need, um, and then unpause the video and see the answer there. That might be a good idea of doing this. Now, these ones are all the reactions that you need to know for AQA, so these are actually specific for AQA, so you need to know every single one of these, okay? Okay, so let's start with the first one, which is alcohol to aldehyde. So pause the video and have a think about what you think the reagents and conditions are to do this okay well this one is potassium dichromate sulfuric acid and we're going to heat um, primary alcohols in the distillation kit so bring the primary alcohols for me alcohol uh, for me aldehyde okay so what about aldehyde to alcohol have a think about that one okay well this one is sodium borohydride nabh4 uh, in methanol and water so that's your reducing agent okay so what about aldehyde to carboxylic acid well that one is potassium dichromate so there's your oxidizing agent sulfuric acid and it's done under reflux okay so what about alcohol to ketone okay well that one is potassium dichromate sulfuric acid um, heat um, and we use a secondary alcohol obviously to form our ketone um, and we use a reflux kit to do that okay so what about this one so this is ketone to alcohol okay well that one is sodium borohydride in methanol and water so again we're using a reducing agent for that one okay so what about alcohol to alkene okay so that one is concentrated sulfuric acid and phosphor or you can use phosphoric acid and heat to do that so just a little bit of a joke why are geordie so good at chemistry because they're alkene uh, right next moving on um <laughs> if you see my videos you probably get used to a terrible jokes uh, right alkene to alcohol uh, that one's going to be steam phosphoric acid catalyst 60 atmospheres 300 degrees celsius okay so what about 
alcohol to halo alkane. Well, that one's going to be sodium halide. So sodium halide, anything such as NaCl, NaBr, whatever that is, whatever you're reacting it with, um, to form, and we're going to react that with sulfuric acid, catalyst, and 20 degrees Celsius. So what about halo alkane to alcohol? Well, this one we're going to use warm sodium hydroxide, water, and this is going to be done under reflux, as you'll find a lot of organic reactions are. Okay, what about alkane to halo alkane? Well, this one's going to be halogen and UV light. Okay, so this is a, um, a, a classic reaction where you're using radicals, free radical reaction. Okay, so what about alkene to halo alkane? Okay, well, that one's going to be HX, which is your hydrogen halide, and 20 degrees Celsius. So what about the halo alkane to alkene? Well, that one's going to be potassium hydroxide, ethanol, and reflux. So what about alkene to dihaloalkane? That one's going to be halogen, and it's going to be at 20 degrees Celsius. And what about alkene to alkane? Okay, well, that one's going to be hydrogen, nickel catalyst, and it's going to be at 150 degrees Celsius. Okay, and um, there's a few more, so... Because uh, I can't fit them all onto one slide, so it's really, really difficult. So what I've done is I've brought some from the previous slide and added new ones. Anything from the previous slide, you can see I've just put previous slide next to it. So there's nothing, there's not, so, so a lot of these is just connecting down from the previous one. Okay, so again, we'll do the same thing. So what about haloalkane to nitrile? Okay, well, that one's potassium cyanide, ethanol, and reflux. So what about nitrile to primary amine? Okay, so we're using lithium aluminium hydride, so reducing agent again, um, and dilute sulfuric acid, so that's reduction. Okay, so what about haloalkane to primary amine? Okay, so this is going to be ammonia and heat. So what about haloalkane to secondary or tertiary amine and quaternary ammonium salts? Okay, so that one's going to be ammonia as well and heat, because we're forming amine still so it was forming the same one so that one uh, continues to react when we got the halo uh, the halo alkane reacting with an ammonia and then that forms your amine and then the amine can then react with more halo alkane to form a secondary and react again to form tertiary so it keeps on reacting so you might remember that one okay so what about this one here so aldehyde or ketone to a hydroxy nitrile okay so that one's going to be potassium cyanide sulfuric acid and it's all going to be done at 20 degrees celsius so just room temperature will be fine what about this one so acid chloride or anhydride forming carboxylic acid okay so that one's going to be 20 degrees and it's you're just going to use water for that one to form your carboxylic acid okay so what about your carboxylic acid to ester Okay, well, that one's going to be sulfuric acid, so it's got to be concentrated sulfuric acid, uh, alcohol, and we're going to use heat in the catalyst as well to do that. So the sulfuric acid is your catalyst. Okay, so what about ester to carboxylic acid? So this is going backwards. Okay, so this one, we're going to use sulfuric acid. Dilute sulfuric acid will be fine, and water. Um, we're going to use reflux and, and catalyst, or we can use dilute sodium hydroxide and reflux. So we're just... Um, uh, breaking it down to form your carboxylic acids back again so it's hydrolysis of an ester remember okay so what about acid chloride to ester okay so that one's going to be alcohol at 20 degrees celsius okay so what about acid chloride to primary amide okay so this one's going to be ammonia and 20 degrees celsius and what about acid chloride or anhydride to n substituted amide well, that one's going to be an amine at 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, so um, there's a lot of reactions there. And I think the key thing is just trying to remember, obviously, obviously that is the key thing, is trying to remember what the reaction conditions are. But you've also got to just take your time with it. You know, start well in advance of your exam and make sure you can go through each one of them. There's nothing new on these slides here. These are all reactions that you've seen already. It's just putting them all in one place. Um, and obviously, organic synthesis is vital and you'll see later on why but organic synthesis is so important for uh, for organic chemists to to know these steps and what you can make from them 
Okay, so let's have a look at aromatic organic synthesis. So this one, I'm just going to go through the, there's not as many of these. So I'm just going to go through your reaction conditions and what they what they start with. So we're going to start with benzene with all of these. Okay, and we're going to add different groups to the benzene ring. So you can see here, nitration is the first one. So we're going to use concentrated sulfuric acid and uh, concentrated nitric acid under 55 degrees if you do it over remember you get multiple nitration on that benzene ring so under 55 and we get nitro benzene okay um, and then if we continue we can reduce nitro benzene to produce phenyl amine which is nh2 so we use concentrated hydrochloric acid tin and reflux and we add a bit of sodium hydroxide in there as well okay and then we can react that even further and we can form our N uh, phenylethanamide, as you can see there. And all we do is react that with an acid chloride at room temperature and pressure. So this is just, you might have seen that, well, you will have seen the acid chloride um, uh, reactions. There's quite a few of them in there in the acid, carboxylic acid and derivatives video. So go and have a look there if you're not comfortable with that. Um, but um, yes, you would have seen your acid chloride reactions there. And then what about this one as well? This is acylation, Friedelcrafts. So um, phenyl ketone is formed by reacting an acid chloride with an aluminium um, aluminium trichloride catalyst. So that's your halogen carrier, all under reflux um, and hydrous conditions as well. So we use um, uh, anhydrous, no water, basically. Okay, so they're the only ones that you need to know. There's not not many of them for your aromatic ones now. Obviously, organic synthesis is vital for chemists, as I say. So um, chemists use this to make drugs. Um, but what they have to do is try and make sure that they're cost effective, that they're safe to use, the environmental impacts of that as well. So there's a lot of different aspects that a chemist must consider when making a new substance using them um, organic pathways that we've seen there. So chemists, um, like I say, they try to use these synthetic roots using start materials that are not toxic. So ideally, we don't want to use materials which are, um, which are, which can harm us. For example, you might get carcinogenic, they might be corrosive, um, they might give off a toxic fume, they might be difficult to handle, the, you know, so there's various different ways. So trying to find um, a, a chemical to start with that's low, that has a low toxicity is, is really important. And just as important as well is waste reduction. What we want to try and do is produce our product, obviously, but we don't want to have a large amount of waste uh, because if we have a high amount of waste, then that's going to cost money and it's also not very good for the environment either. So we're looking for reactions with high atom economies, high percentage yields, um, anything which has as little steps as you possibly can. If Obviously, if you're going through numerous steps, there's more chance of something being lost. Um, and so therefore it's not as efficient so that's just that's really really important as well and obviously with as with anything in chemistry we need generally we need to dissolve it in something so solvents are used in chemical reactions however some of these solvents can be for example alcohols uh, can be flammable it could be toxic as well and that increases waste because obviously the solvent is there just to help the reaction to to actually to actually proceed to go you need to suspend it in something for the reaction to happen so chemists try to develop synthetic roots where solvents are not used or are minimized so that's that's quite important obviously even with water um, you know, water can be a waste product um, of these chemical reactions. Um, so water is a um, as a solvent. So water isn't um, isn't ideal because we want to try and preserve water as well. So very important for for chemists to try and you know produce these things um, properly and um, safely, and obviously with a low environmental impact. Okay, so that's all of your organic synthesis that you need to know. So there's there's a lot of reactions there. The key thing, like I say, is just doing it over time, trying to remember the steps and trying to work out what connects with what. I think it's a nice summary, I think, um, rather than just having it as individual, because you would have seen all of these reactions across various different topics. And sometimes it can, be, it can seem a bit disjointed and you kind of get a little bit lost as to what you need to know. So putting it in a map like that kind of helps you. But by all means, you know, have a um, have a look at it there. Okay, so um, NMR spectroscopy. Okay, so we've looked at the organic synthesis side, so now we're going to look at NMR spectroscopy. Now, NMR spectroscopy is a type of spectroscopy that you may have seen. Um, you may have seen other types of spectroscopy, such as infrared. Um, you would have seen mass spectrometry. Um, you would have seen chromatography as well. I'm actually going to look at chromatography again in this topic because it's a type of um, it's about type of 
technique mainly for separation but we can also detect certain substances as well so nmr is another type now nmr stands for nuclear magnetic resonance so nmr spectroscopy and it's used to help determine the structure of a molecule now just one point here i suppose that i should mention um is that nmr um is obviously used in, in chemistry but it's also used um, it's also used in medicine as well, except in medicine, they call it MRI, so magnetic resonance imaging. So they don't use NMR, even though the machine is pretty much the same, you know, the, the, the basics of the machine. So um, I wonder why they actually call it MRI and NMR, why they've decided to change it. So um, I'll tell you why towards the end of the video. I'll tell you why they've actually changed it there. But um, so NMR, obviously, we're going to call it for chemistry purposes, we're going to call it nuclear magnetic resonance. Okay. So really useful, it tells us the structure of a molecule, which is unlike any other type of spectroscopy, or, or sorry, analytical technique that we've seen already. So there are two main types that you need to know for AQA, and that is a carbon-13 NMR, um, which looks at how carbon atoms are arranged, and proton NMR, which tells us how hydrogen atoms are arranged. So if an, at if an atomic nucleus has an odd number of nucleons that's the protons and neutrons that exist in the middle of the atom then it has a nuclear spin okay so in other words it can spin around so your nuclear spin when you have your nucleons spinning around this creates a weak magnetic field and nmr is actually detecting how these magnetic fields are affected by a larger external magnetic field okay so imagine these nucleons spinning around okay so they're spinning and they're producing a small magnetic field um and there's a um obviously nmr produces an external magnetic field as you'll see later i think all of this here i think is just trying to understand how an nmr machine works i think if you dive into nmr not really sure how it works i think it's quite difficult to understand you know appreciate what it can do and, and explaining it and i think having this bit of an introduction actually helps you to kind of say right okay that's how it works um you know and and, and appreciate what nmr actually stands for and what you're looking for as well okay so um hydrogen has one proton so it does have a nuclear spin because it's an odd number of nucleons remember now carbon however normally has six because if you look at the periodic table you can see carbon has got an atomic number of six but a small small percentage of carbon atoms so one percent is actually carbon 13 now that is an odd number of nucleons in there so we'll have a nuclear spin in these elements so when we're looking at nmr spectroscopy for proton and carbon 13 what we're looking for um is obviously proton is fine because there's loads of them that's the that's um h1 but your carbon one we're actually only looking at um nmr will only detect carbon 13 it won't detect carbon 12 because that's an even number of nucleons okay so um let's go into this a little bit further okay so we know a little bit about just to summarize so far so we know what types of nmr machine we can get proton and carbon and we'll look at them a little bit more detail later and we know that um, we need to have an odd number of nucleon for NMR to detect it. So any atoms with an even number won't be detected by NMR. And we know that um, they, when they spin, they have a nuclear spin, that they produce a small little magnetic field around them. Okay, and that can be influenced by something else. Okay, so that's what we've learned so far. So these nuclei, these spin in loads of different random directions okay normally so without any external magnetic field applied they um, spin it in all sorts of directions but when we apply a magnetic field an external magnetic field to these nucleons they align either with the magnetic field or they align against the magnetic field okay so they align in different ways so like i say nuclei either spin in the direction of the magnetic field or against it and those that spin in the direction of the magnetic field actually have lower energy and we'll look at that in a minute on the diagram but looking at this diagram here now this one here there's gonna be another one that pops up on the right there as you can see um uh, where it is there it is okay so in the right hand side there one is actually going to appear there in a moment but you can see here what i've represented the spin by is the yellow arrows here now where there's no magnetic field applied the spin of the nucleon spin in all sorts of random directions there's no kind of order here okay but the moment we apply when we put a sample into an nmr machine it applies an external magnetic field okay so 
what happens is this. So we've got an external magnetic field has been applied, as you can see with the white arrows. And you can see that we have two different levels. Some will spin with the magnetic field and some will spin against the magnetic field. So you can see there they're starting to align either with or against the magnetic field. And you can see the ones that spin against the magnetic field have higher energy than the ones that spin with the magnetic field, which have lower energy at the bottom there. Okay. So NMR actually fires out radio waves as well. So it applies that magnetic field. And then once it's done that, it then shoots out radio waves at a really specific frequency. Um, uh, also at a range of different frequencies. So at a specific frequency, the nuclei that are aligned with the magnetic field. So these are the ones at the bottom here, remember? So these are the ones that are aligned with the magnetic field, absorb that energy and actually flip up to a higher energy level. Okay, so we effectively excite these nucleons. They go from the base up to the top there because they've got a little bit of energy that's been provided by the NMR machine. Okay, so those with the higher energy can also drop lower and when they do that they actually emit um, um, uh, energy in terms of um, in ter on the electromagnetic spectrum so they produce that when they jump back down and basically when we start with this process there's more nuclei aligned with the magnetic field overall because that's lower energy so you'd imagine that most of them would be in that phase there anyway so overall, more energy is actually absorbed than admitted, okay, than emitted um, back when they jump back down. And NMR, all NMR is doing is it's measuring the amount of energy absorbed, okay? So that's all it's doing. Now, um, the gap between these two here, so this gap here between here and here changes depending on, so imagine this is an atom, so like a carbon atom, for example, um, depending on what that carbon is bonded to, Okay, will depend on that gap there. Okay, so um, the gap could be narrower, it could be broader. And clearly that's going to have an impact on uh, what the NMR machine detects. So it's actually detecting what's next door to it. And NMR is really more concerned with what's next to the atom that we're, that's been targeted by the machine rather than the actual atom. Okay, so it's all about what's next door to it, what's influencing this. Okay, and you'll see this later on. It'll go... We're just kind of opening this box slowly, just so we're in it step by step, so you can see how this is working. Okay. So, like I say, the energy absorbed by the nuclei is dependent upon the environment that it sits in. Okay, so this is really starting to get into, you know, where we're pulling all this information that we know so far, and pulling it all together and applying it into spectra, which we're going to look at a lot at in this video. So... A nucleus, okay, so you've got your nucleus atom, uh, let's say, sorry, you've got your carbon atom, let's say. The carbon atom has a nucleus, like all atoms do, okay. These can actually be shielded from that external magnetic field um, from electrons surrounding that nucleus. So it's a little bit like, and this is my mad imagination, but it's a bit like going down a hill with loads of rocks on it, okay. Um, so let's say you're going to roll down a hill with loads of rocks on it, uh, you're going to get hurt, okay, because you're going to get jabbed and poked by these rocks as you descend down the hill. Now, let's imagine we do exactly the same, but we're going to wrap you up in loads and loads of bubble wrap, and we're going to tape all that up, and we're going to push you down the hill. Um, now, you're not going to feel them bumps and, 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 and lumps in the hill as you go down the hill as much as if you didn't have bubble wrap. So, it's the same for atoms, except the hill is an electromagnetic field, an external magnetic field here, sorry. So, that's your external magnetic field is like the rocks. But the atoms themselves are being kind of bombarded, well, not bombarded, but they're being influenced by this external magnetic field can be protected by this electrons that surround it okay so that's a little bit like the bubble wrap around a person okay so we call this shielding okay so it's the shielding effect so atoms that have a good number of electrons around the around the nucleus will be more shielded than those which don't now what can influence the electrons as you will have seen in year one what can influence the electrons around an atom is it being next door to say an electronegative element because that will pull electrons away from that atom and it leaves that atom a little exposed so that's going to appear different in an nmr spectrum compared to um if it was just the atom was just on its own and had no influence so that's really what we're looking at here so like i say atoms and groups of atoms adjacent to this nucleus that's been um, um you know um, exposed to this um magnetic field external magnetic field um 
this affects the, the amount of electron shielding. Like I say, it's them electronegative elements can really pull electrons away from the atom and reduce the shielding in the atom, in the carbon atom, let's say, in this example. So the magnetic field will be felt by the nuclei differently, depending on the environment that they're in, um, as they absorb different, amount of, different amounts of energy at different frequencies. Um, and so NMR spectroscopy will pick that up, will pick that up differently. Okay, so... Um, you can see that the environment is determined by the groups of atoms that exist near to the nuclei being examined. And we look across the full chain, not just what's immediately next to it, um, but looking at the um, we're looking at the full chain along there. So I like to see it a bit like on this street here. There's um, there's hedges across the, the, the people's gardens. And you'll find that they're starting to get a little bit longer now because of this time of year. Um, but you'll find that I'll cut a hedge, okay, um, and you'll find that the neighbour will look at it. Oh, that's a good idea. I'm influenced by what I'm doing, so they're actually going to cut their hedge as well. And you'll find that actually, well down the street, somebody else then cuts the hedge. So my influence, my direct influence, actually influences other people down the street. Or I like to think so, anyway. Um, so it's kind of like a carbon NMR as well. So imagine it's like a carbon atom is a house, and then what's next door to that house is um is my zone of influence if you see what i mean so i will do something and the neighbors will do something and vice versa yeah but it might be neighbors all the way down the street as well it's not just the neighbors immediately next to me who i can influence it's the ones all the way down the bottom of the street as well and vice versa they influence what i do so sometimes somebody else cuts the edge first and i think oh, that's a good idea i'm gonna have to do mine as well so um it's the same thing with carbon nmr so carbon nmr is you've got a carbon atom it's actually influenced um, you know what's next door okay so um so for an atom to be in the same environment it must be bonded to an atom or group of atoms that are identical okay so that's really really important so just using another example uh, another example here um so let's say we we'll stick with a house example let's say we've got a house okay and immediately next door to that house, there's another house that is identical to that one in the middle. Okay, so it's the same. And then immediately on the right hand side, there is another house on that side. So I, if I look out my house, I can see a house to the left and a house to the right. Okay, so um, effectively there's symmetry there. Okay, so I'm looking out into different into a, into a, um, the same view, which is a house. Now let's imagine. I had a house, and to the right was a big, nice green field, okay? And to the left, there was another house. So if I look out my window to my left, I see a house. If I look out my window to my right, I see a field. So I'm looking, I can look at different things, and different, um, I suppose I'm influenced differently, depending on which window I'm going to look out of. So to my right is different, to my left is different, okay? So when you're looking at carbon nmr so carbon 13 nmr you've got to kind of look at it in that way as well you've got to say okay what's next door to that carbon and what's next door to that one are they exactly the same is what's left and right to me identical if it is then we have some form of symmetry okay and effectively i'm in the same environment okay so let's have a look let's just uh let's dive straight in okay so we're going to look at a range of examples that look at identifying carbon and hydrogen environments and the key thing here is looking for the environments so here's the first one so you can see here we're looking at carbon environments in this example so you can see that we've got a molecule here with a bromine in the middle there okay so the purple one is shown one environment so imagine this is a house here now this house is next door to another house let's say with three cars let's imagine and this house is also to the right is next door to another house with three cars so effectively it doesn't matter whether i look left or right i'm effectively looking at the same thing so there's an element of symmetry there and obviously these houses here they're looking at my house in the middle so both of them are looking to my house in the middle um and both of them have three cars each so that's a little bit like um they're in the same environment because they're looking at the same house which is me in the middle okay so this is a way in which we can say right we've got two carbon environments here one in the middle and the two ones on the outside are different carbon environments okay so let's have a look at another example um this time what i've done is i've moved the bromine from the middle to the end and that completely changes the way nmr detects this so you can see here that we've got um three carbon atoms here we've got three different environments now instead of the two here so this carbon here this house in the end has got two cars let's say and is looking out to a field 
to the to the right it's also looking out to the house on the left here now this house in the middle has got two cars but it's looking out to two houses either side uh, this house here has got three cars okay uh, and is looking out to two houses down the right hand side so not a single one of them are looking at the same scene if you see what i mean they don't have the same scenes so this in carbon nmr terms we have three different carbon environments we have one on the right because it's directly bonded to a bromine we have one to the left this carbon here is bonded to a ch3 and is bonded to a ch2br and this carbon here is bonded to a ch2 and a ch2br so each one of them scenarios as you can see there are different okay so they're all different different scenarios so therefore they're three different environments we can also apply this to hydrogen as well, so proton NMR. So this time we're looking at the proton environments, and you can see that these two here are the same environment because they're bonded to the same carbon, which is then bonded to a bromine and a CH3. Uh, and likewise, these hydrogens here are on a different environment because they're bonded to, um, all three of them are bonded to the same carbon, but that carbon's then bonded to a CH2 and a BR. Okay, So we have two hydrogen environments there one with three hydrogens one with two hydrogens but they're in different environments okay and then what about this one this time i've put two bromine atoms i put one on the left and one on the right and you can see here that we've got um, um four hydrogens but they're all in the same environment effectively we have some symmetry so let's have a look let's walk it through so you can see here ch2 is directly bonded to a br and another CH2 and a BR and this CH2 here is bonded to a BR and another CH2 BR so because they're bonded to the same things there's symmetry there then we have less environments so NMR detects that as just one environment with four hydrogen environments in it okay so you can see how actually NMR spectroscopy can detect structure it's looking at what's next door to it it's not looking at yes okay it's looking sometimes at the actual atom that we're looking at but it's also looking at what's next door it's not just about what what we're actually looking at there and that's what other spectroscopy looks like as well such as um mass spectrometry sorry uh, and infrared spectroscopy so both of them only look at the functional groups and atoms that we're looking at this one's actually looking all the way down the line so this is why nmr is so good at structure okay or developing structure so um like i say obviously that's looking at the different environments and that's the key thing when you look at nmr we've you've just had a slight hint there of looking at spectra okay well you haven't actually seen spectra on there but you're looking at okay how many environments do i have that's the first thing that you expected to be able to do okay so when we run these things we're going to look at some proper spectra in a minute but um, when we when we run these things through the machine what we've got to be able to do is is reference is have a reference chemical to measure it against and the reference chemical that we're using is tetramethylsilane or tms now this chemical is used as a standard when we're looking at chemical shift in nmr spectra okay so we're measuring it against something so it's very important in anything in science we need to measure it um, you know, we need to have something that we can say, right, that's what I measure it against. We can see how much of an influence it's having. It's really important to be able to do that. So as nuclei absorb different amounts of energy at different frequencies, it's really difficult to measure the magnitude of these without this reference that we're going to use. And we're also using TMS as the, as the reference. So TMF, TMS is this. You've got silicon in the middle and you've got four methyl groups that are surrounding the silicon in the middle. Now, TMS has 12 hydrogens in total. They're all identical. You can see all these hydrogens are bonded to it, a carbon, which is then bonded to the same atom in the middle, which is silicon. Now, what this does in an NMR machine is this gives a really nice strong peak that is, um, you know, that, that has no kind of, there's no polarity, um, you know, there's no polarity as such in here. Um, it's a nice, strong single peak, well away from any other peak that we're going to be seeing on the spectra. And the other reason why we use um, tetramethylsilane is because it's actually inert. It's non-toxic, so that's brilliant. Remember, from organic synthesis, we don't be using toxic chemicals where, if we can avoid them. Um, and it's volatile, so we can remove it from our sample. So effectively, we take our sample, we put it in the NMR, we take our sample, we add TMS to that sample, we put it in our NMR machine, and basically, um, we're going to measure the reference points of the shifts. We'll look at chemical shifts um, just in a moment, but we're going to measure um, the shift 
uh, of these chemicals that we're testing against TMS. But we need to remove TMS from our sample at the end there as well. So like I say, we're going to look at something called shift. So shift um, is given, or chemical shift is given this um, this um, delta symbol here. Okay, so you'll see it on some of the graphs. And basically the difference between the TMS peak, which will be set to zero in an MR machine, and the chemical and 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 um, uh, other peaks on the spectra is the chemicals that we're testing, is the environments that we're looking at. But you'll see this, um, like I say, in a lot more detail in the spectra um, soon. Okay, so like I say, we measure chemical shifts in parts per million, and we always give TMS um, a chemical shift value of zero. So that's our reference point there. Okay. So, um. When we look at NMR spectrum, you'll often see a peak at zero, and we will. It's a, I think it's a lot easier looking at spectra. Um, you know, then we can kind of pick up and learn from it. But you'll always see a peak at zero is your reference chemical. That's TMS. That's your reference chemical, and that's used to calibrate your NMR machines when we're analysing the sample. So it means that we're measuring everything relative to that. Okay, and then we can we can then look at and you'll be given chemical shift data in the exam. Be given a data sheet with it all on, um, and then you use that data sheet to then work out what functional groups you may have or what you know what um, structure you may have but we'll look at that in a lot more example like you say the key thing with NMR is just practice 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 okay so it's all well and good me telling you what TMS is and all this but you need to actually see it in a spectra okay so what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of these spectra now okay and we're going to start with carbon 13 so remember we said there was two types of NMR spectra so there's carbon 13 uh, and there was proton NMR spectrum. So we're going to look at carbon-13 first. So carbon-13 tells us how many different carbon environments there are in a sample that's actually been tested. Okay. So the peaks on that carbon-13 tell us the number of different carbon environments there are. So remember we looked in the previous, just um, um, a few moments ago, when we looked at um, we looked at the different environments that there are, in the NMR spectrum, we looked at the different uh, carbon environments and hydrogen environments. What we're going to do is translate that into a spectrum, and you'll see how that how that links. So you can see here we've got a carbon thirteen spectrum, okay, and we're going to run the sample of this this chemical here, okay. Uh, let me just pull it across. There it is. Okay, so you've got your um, so this is chloroethane. This is the chemical here. Now each carbon in this molecule. Um, is in different is in a different environment um, and there's a different amount of electron shielding so what we see is two peaks okay so the reason why we say shielding remember what we're saying is we're looking at for this one because it's carbon 13 we're looking at the nucleons and these carbons here but the nucleons in here are surrounded by electrons because there's electrons in the outside of this carbon but this chlorine is going to pull some of them electrons away so we're going to strip some of the shielding away from that clock from that carbon and obviously that's going to be more influenced by the um, external magnetic field and likewise this carbon here is next is kind of near the chlorine but it's a little bit further away so it's not going to be influenced as much the electrons in here are not going to be pulled over as much with that one so let's have a look and see how we can um how we can break this down in terms of our spectra so you can see here the red carbon that's closest to that electronegative chlorine that's pulling them electrons away um, the shielding's a lot lower so therefore it shifts further up that spectrum it's much more influenced by that uh, external magnetic field so let's have a look at the other one. This is the green one here. So this carbon is then going to be sat um, a little bit closer to the TMS peak, as you can see there. Okay. So the electron shielding isn't as um, is is greater. Sorry, in this carbon um, because it's further away from the chlorine, and so therefore we have a lower chemical shift. Now remember this peak at zero. Can you remember what that is? Well, this one's TMS, so that's your reference. So you'll see what I mean. You get a peak that's well away from all the other peaks that we're sampling, and so therefore that one's caused by TMS. Okay, so let's continue with carbon-13 spectroscopy, because we still need to look at um, the carbon environments. Okay, so remember, that tells us the number of carbon environments there are in the sample that's actually been tested. So cyclic compounds... Um, looking at the cyclic compounds with the environments in cyclic compounds, um, we they're quite difficult to predict the spectra in cyclic compounds. Um, and in these, what we're looking for is symmetry. Okay, to which um, for for 
carbons or different carbon environments. So here I've brought across a cyclic compound. Okay, we've got two uh, two chlorine atoms coming from our cyclo uh, cyclohexane. Okay, so this so this is our organic uh, organic substance here. Now what we're going to look for are, is a line of symmetry, and a line of symmetry is right there. Okay, so it's straight through the middle, and you can see that there are four. Well, you may be able to see there are four different carbon environments in one three dichlorocyclohexane, which is the chemical we're looking at. Okay, so using that line of symmetry, we can then look for similarities and differences in these different carbon environments. So let's have a look. So let's look at the first one. So the one right at the end there in green. So this is one carbon environment because if you look. This carbon here is bonded to a CCL and a CCL, um, and then further around is a CH2 and a CH2 this side, and then for, further around there. So this one is one environment for this carbon. So NMR will detect that as its own distinct environment. So if we have a look at the next ones, so both of these are CCL bonds. So they're in the same environment. They're both bonded to that one in the middle there, which is the green one. And they're on the other side, they're then both bonded to um, a CH2 here and a CH2 there and the, then around there so you can see there's a lot of symmetry there so if we keep on going these two the purple ones here these ones are again in the same environment they're both bonded to the right hand side they're both bonded to um, a CCL and a CCL um, and then they're both bonded to this carbon here which is a CH2 so you can see there's an element of symmetry there so that's a different environment and then finally we've got the yellow one here or the orange one, I should say, which is that peak there. Now, remember, the ones which are directly, um, or the ones which are, um, you know, have the, are, are, are near the um, hydro, the, the uh, halogens, the electronegative halogens, are the ones which are going to be shifted a little bit higher up. So you can see here the red and green ones are shifted the furthest. As you get further away from these electronegative elements, um, the shift isn't as great. And obviously, this one's furthest away from all of them, so that one has shifted a lot less. So is so it's obviously on the on the right hand side of that of that graph. Now you see you got the peak at zero. This again is because of TMS. So that is your reference chemical. Okay. So you can see here, we're just looking for symmetry with cyclic compounds. Look at the symmetry and see if we can detect the different um, environments in there. Okay, so looking at, so carbon-13 shift. So we looked at the shifts. So we're looking at the, see the little numbers on the bottom of that graph that we'd seen before. Um, they actually have values, and these values tell us a little bit about the environment that that carbon could possibly be in. Okay, now you will be given this data in on a data sheet, and so you are provided with something a little bit like this. It might not be exact, it might not be the the numbers may be slightly slightly different, but it gives you an idea. Okay, so it tells you the shift patterns. Um, and it tells us the type of carbon or the environment that this carbon's in. So, for example, you can see your low shifted ones, the ones further to the right hand side of the graph, are going to be um, things like CC. But the ones where you've got carbon, say it might be bonded to um, an electronegative element like this, are higher or shifted a little bit higher up because these electronegative elements are obviously pulling electrons away. So, that's the type of things, these are the type of regions that we're looking at. So, like I say, we can match up the positions of the peaks on our spectra to this data and we can work up the environments that it's in and this is going to be very important because we can then use this to determine the structure of our compound. So there are some issues though, um, it's not all perfect and this is why we don't just use NMR, we use multiple uh, spectra to work this out, but a peak at 190 will suggest a carbonyl group, however we can't be sure if this is an aldehyde or a ketone, okay, so it won't distinguish that, it's not quite that clever, but um, um, there are overlaps as well. So peak at 60, for example, you can see here, um, could be an amine, it could be an alcohol, it could be an ester, or it could be an ether. So it's narrowing it down, but it isn't it isn't exact. Okay, so there's a lot of there's a lot of crossover here, a lot of overlap. But we use this and other spectra to, to work this out, of course. Okay, so let's look at an example here. So we've got an example um, here as a chemical has the formula of C3H8O and its spectrum is shown below. And what we want to try and work out is its displayed formula. Okay, so let's have a look. So the first thing is we need to draw down all the possible isomers of this compound here. Once you've got your possible isomers, it's then easier to then kind of either rule it out or, or confirm it. So let's have a look at our isomers. 
So there they are. So there's our isomers for this chemical. So these are the th there's only three isomers for this. And so what we need to do is look at the number of peaks. Now you can see here that we've got three peaks. Okay. So this, um, so because there's three peaks, there's three different environments. And so this rules out propan 2 ol because propan 2 ol actually has, this is the one at the bottom there, um, propan 2 ol actually has um, two carbon environments, as you can see there, whereas these ones have three. So straight away, we can give a big cross next to that one because it isn't that. So then we've narrowed it down to these two at least. So we can say we have two peaks at 65 and 75. Um, and this suggests that two carbons are actually bonded to an electronegative element. Um, so that could be something like oxygen, for example. Okay. Um, and so this fits actually the structure of the ether rather than your propan one ol where we'd only see one peak in this area. So you can see here that we've got these two have shifted quite high up. So this is suggesting that both of these carbons here, if you look on the data table as well that you'd seen before, this suggests that both these carbons are bonded to an oxygen, as you can see there. And then this one is then a little bit out, out, out of the way and has shifted nowhere near as much as you can see on there. So what we can deduce from this is actually, it's the one on the left, the ether, that this structure represents, okay? Fairly straightforward, okay? So what we're looking for, the key thing with NMR, like I say, is to practice, 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 okay? Keep going, keep practicing it, loads of, look at loads of spectra, okay? Um, so now what we're going to do is going to look at the other type of NMR, which is proton NMR. Now, proton NMR has um, a lot more to do with it. You've now got, you've introduced in a little bit more detail with proton NMR. So we can look at, for example, um, neighboring hydrogens. We can look at how many there are. And this is a really powerful form of um, NMR spectroscopy. It tells us a lot more than what carbon does. So... Um, NMR or proton NMR spectra tells us how many different hydrogen environments there are and it tells us how many hydrogens uh, in each environment are actually in the sample. Now this is great because this is telling us a lot more information than we had from, from, carbon, uh, from carbon NMR. Okay, So the peaks on a proton NMR spectrum, they tell us the number of different hydrogen environments. This is no different to a carbon NMR spectrum. So remember, carbon NMR spectrum has um, peaks, but it tells us the number of carbon environments in uh, in our molecule. Hydrogen does exactly the same, okay? So there's no difference there. So let's have a look. So we can see here that we've got a, a proton NMR spectrum, very similar to carbon-13. I think the main difference here is you'll see that the shift values are lower. Um, they're not as high as your carbon-13 shift values. Um, but nonetheless, the, the spectrum is pretty much the same. So you can see here we've got ethanoic acid here. So we've got a carboxylic acid. So the numbers in this spectrum here, and you'll see this is slightly different to what you'd see in carbon-13, the numbers actually tells us the ratio of the areas under the peaks. And what this allows us to do is work out the relative number of hydrogens in each of them environments. Um, and sometimes these can be decimals as well. So you can see here that we have um, a, a peak here, but it's really difficult because it's so thin. It's really difficult to measure the area under that. So what NMR, proton NMR, you know, usefully does is it says, right, what we're going to do is we're going to convert that area into what we call an integration trace. That's this red line here. So it's literally turning an area into a vertical line. And the ratio of this line to this line is a three to one ratio. So that's telling us that we have three hydrogens in this environment and we have one hydrogen in this environment here on the left. So if we link that in with our molecule, we can see that we have the red one, which is there, which is one hydrogen in, okay? And then with the three hydrogens there on the end, that's linking to the big peak there on the right, which is that one there, okay? So we have two hydrogen environments, which is spot on because we've got hydrogen on our carboxyl group. We've got hydrogens on the alkyl group towards the end there. But NMR, proton NMR is actually saying, right, well, actually, okay, you've got two environments, but you've also got three hydrogens in this environment and you've only got one hydrogen in this environment. So we're getting a little bit more information from proton NMR. Okay, and obviously the peak here is caused by TMS. That's that one there. So there's no difference um, whether it's carbon or proton NMR. Um, you know the TMS is used with with both of them. 
Okay, so the peak on the left, this has a value of one, and the peak on the right has a value of three. So this means, like I say, that we have three hydrogens in one environment and one hydrogen in the other. So we have a three to one ratio. But remember, the integration trace on there um, is actually shown as the, and um, we'll look at a little bit more of the integration trace, uh, but remember, it's the area under that peak. It's not the height of the peak that tells us how many hydrogens are, it's the area. So it's measuring, your NMR machine will put an integration trace on, which is that red line. It's measuring the relative heights of that red line, not the peak, okay? Because the peak, the height of the peak, doesn't tell us how many hydrogens it is, it's the area underneath, but it's really difficult to measure area. So we use this integration trace, but we'll look on that a little bit more um, later on. Okay, so just like with carbon-13 NMR, we also have a data table of proton NMR. And again, you will be given this in your data sheet, in okay, case so you don't need to worry about it. Now, the hydrogens that are under examination are the ones that are highlighted in red here. Okay, and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail when we look at how we actually put all this together. But this hydrogen here, so this one, our NMR machine is saying, right, we've got a hydrogen and it's bonded next to this O and an R. Um, this one here is a hydrogen and it's bonded next to a carbon um, with an alkyl group on the end. And likewise, this hydrogen here, this NMR machine is picking up a hydrogen that's bonded to a C, a, a carbon, and that carbon is then bonded to an oxygen and a, um, a double bond oxygen here. So that's like an ester group here. So this is telling us that we have an ester. So depending on, obviously, the, the shift of these will depend on, obviously, what type of chemical we, we, we probably have. So let's have a look at the spectrum that we'd seen before on the previous slide. So using the um, previous spectrum of ethanoic acid, we have a peak at 11.7, which is this one here. So that's that peak. So that's telling us that we have a carboxyl group. So that's fine. We confirm that. Uh, but also we have a peak at 2.1 here, which is suggesting that we have this CH3 group here. And this CH3, because we know it's three, because it had, had an integration of three, and this CH3 is bonded directly to the C double bond O, which is, fits in nicely with this here. So effectively, the CH3, this bit, is, is that R group there, okay, which is fine. So that's telling us we have a, a carboxylic acid. Okay, so, um, yeah, NMR spectrum, they have peaks that split, okay? Now, this is where it gets a little bit complicated because with carbon-13, you just had standard peaks. That was fine. But with NMR, we have peaks that split into smaller peaks. Um, and this really, really powerful tool actually really helps us to determine the structure of our molecule, which carbon-13 didn't do, okay? So this is the difference between proton and NMR. It allows us to look at it a little bit more detail at this molecule. So peaks that are split into smaller peaks, we call this a splitting pattern, okay? Um, and the number of smaller peaks corresponds to the number of hydrogens in the adjacent carbons. Yep, it's not looking at the single ones. Remember your integration trace showed you the number of carbons in that, uh, so the number of hydrogens in that environment. Your splitting peaks is actually saying, well, how many hydrogens are on the neighboring carbon? Okay, um, now this is uh, adjacent to it, so we're not having to go all the way down the chain here. You'll see an example in a minute, um, but we're just looking at the immediate one. Now, we use a rule called an N plus 1 rule. So, in other words, it's the number of people, uh, so the number of people, the number of hydrogens plus 1. Okay, so that's how it's split. So, it's a little bit like saying... Um, in you know how many people live in this household in my household and then i can say right well how many people live next door to my left and how many people are living next door to the right and effectively um the the design or the splitting of my house imagine you could split the house up is influenced by how many people live next door to me and so hydrogen or proton nmr is uh, the splitting pattern of this um allows us to say right well yeah what's next door to this what does it look like next door so we're painting this picture of what's neighboring it so the splitting pattern, for example, um, if a singlet, we have a singlet peak in our spectrum, this means that we have no hydrogens um, on the neighboring carbon. Okay, so we've got a hydrogen um, and it's next door to a um, uh, it's next door to a carbon, or it might not be next door to a carbon at all, in which case it's definitely a singlet. But if it's bonded to a carbon and that carbon has no other hydrogens, then we're going to get a singlet peak. A doublet peak, we get one hydrogen on the neighbouring carbon. A triplet peak, we get two hydrogens on the neighbouring carbon. And a quartet peak is three hydrogens on the neighbouring carbon. So you can see here, like triplet is three, N plus one. So number of hydrogens on the neighbouring carbon is two plus one, so we get a triplet. Okay, you'll see this in a little bit more detail 
when we look at an example here. So you can see here we've got a, um, a ethanol here as our as our chemical, and we've got our proton NMR spectrum that's on the left there. So you can see we've got our OH group, our CH2 group, and a CH3 group, and you can see that the peaks have split. So you've got funny diff like some different shapes there. So let's have a look and break it down. So we can see this hydrogen here is bonded to an oxygen. Okay, so this is not a carbon. So the hydrogen, so there's no hydrogens attached to it. So therefore, we apply the n plus one rule. So that's no hydrogens plus one is one. That's a singlet. And in fact, we have a singlet peak, um, as you can see on the left there. Okay, so there's your singlet peak, which is there. Okay, singlet. So it's not bonded. This OH is not bonded. I've labeled it here so you can see. So you can see what's happening. Okay, so let's look at the next one. So here, the hydrogens on CH2 are adjacent to one carbon that has three hydrogens on it. So you can see here, this itself will have an integration of two because it's got two hydrogens, but it's next door to an oxygen, so that's that's not a carbon, but it's next door to a carbon here with three hydrogens on. So three plus one is four. So this peak itself will have an integration of two because it's got two hydrogens, but it's next door to a carbon with three, so it would, the peak would split into four. It's a quartet, so n plus one rule. Okay, so let's look at the final one. So these three hydrogens here are adjacent to a carbon with two hydrogens. So we do two plus one, which is three. This is going to be a triplet, and you can see here, this peak is definitely a triplet peak. So it has an integration of three, because it has three hydrogens itself, but is next door to a carbon with two hydrogens, as you can see there. So this is going to be a, a triplet peak, as you can see there. So there's your triplet, and obviously there's your quartet for this peak there. So you can see here, it's all about what's next door, how many hydrogens that have. So it's not just about what's what we're looking at. It's about more about what's next door as well. Okay. So it's like a it's like a nosy form of um, of uh, analytical technique. It's say, like, okay, well, what, what's next door, and you know, uh, how many how many hydrogens does that have? It's very nosy, but useful, of course. Okay, so remember, just coming back to that integration trace, so remember we mentioned that before. I think it's just important to just come back to this. Now we've kind of looked at a bit of splitting, a splitting patterns, and we've looked at that. I think it's very important to bring it back to integration trace and just distinguish the difference between an integration trace and a splitting pattern, okay? So integration traces, remember, show us the peak more clearly and helps us to work out the hydrogen ratio. So when we have split peaks, in particular it's really difficult to work out the area under these split peaks because you've got multiple types so like i say this integration trace is used um, to vectorly convert the area into a height ratio and, and it'll produce a line now your nmr machine will produce this line you just have to do something with that line to work out what this is so in practice what we would do if it didn't give us the numbers is we'd use a ruler to measure the vertical parts of our integration trace and what we do is write the lengths down and use this number to come up with a ratio okay so it's about it's about the ratio that tells us so you can see in this spectrum um, this shows an integration it shows the integration trace with a 1 to 1 and a half to 1 and a half uh, ratio and we can round that to 2 to 3 to 3 so you can see here that these heights here these heights are the same, so they're both one and a half, um, and this height here is one. This is a little bit shorter than these heights. So we can see this has got a two to three to three ratio, so perhaps two carbons, three carbons, three carbons, okay? So that's what these integration traces are showing us. So it says here in this, in this spectrum here that we have three different hydrogen environments, one with two hydrogens and the other um, uh, and the other has three environments, uh, as you see, the other two, should I say that, should say two, TWO, obviously. So the other two environments have three hydrogens there, okay? So we know what an integration trace is, so we know integration tells us the number of hydrogens in that environment, and the splitting pattern tells us the number of hydrogens neighboring that hydrogen that we're looking at, okay? So now what we're going to do is we're going to... Um, is we're going to look at how we can actually um, determine or looking at the splitting patterns and looking at integration but then we're going to look at how we can actually um, um, determining um, different functional groups so really kind of specifying certain groups some of them can be a little bit as we've seen before you can get a little bit of confusion get a bit of overlap so this one we're going to use um, um, 
using non-hydrogen-based solvents um, when we're running the spectra here because we don't want any confusion um, with some of the um, solvent that we're using. So the solvent we use is instead of using water, and a water has hydrogens in it, so if we use water solvent, we take our substance, dissolve it in water, run it through the NMR machine, NMR is going to pick up the hydrogen in water and that's going to really kind of cause confusion because we're going to get a messy spectrum with a lot of overlap. So we don't use H2O, we use D2O, okay? So deuterium is just an isotope of hydrogen, okay? It has an even number of nucleons. So remember right at the start, we said that you need an odd number for it to be detected by NMR. If we use an even number of nucleons in here, then our NMR machine will not detect it. It won't pick it up. So we use D2O, okay? So it has a proton and it has an extra, it has a neutron in there as well. So deuterium has got a proton neutron, so it's an even number of nucleons. So therefore, won't be detected by the NMR machine. So, like I say, deuterium's got the even number, it's not detected, so the only peaks that we'll see is from our sample and not from our solvent. We can also use another type of solvent, which is CCL4, um, which is this one here. So, um, this is another one where we've got an even number of nucleons, um, it can dissolve um, substances as well, really good solvent to use, and it won't be detected by NMR, so we don't want any confusion in our spectra. Okay, so we're going to look at an example. So we're putting all this together and we're going to look at an example of a proton NMR spectrum. So here we're going to look at um, a spectrum here. And we're going to predict the structure of the compound using the data table from this proton NMR spectrum with a molecular formula of C4H8O2. So you can see we've got our spectrum there. And we've got our integration numbers of 2 to 3 to 3 as you can see on there. And we've got our splitting patterns as well for each of these peaks. So let's have a look, let's dive in. So we've got three hydrogen environments. That's the first thing we can detect here. We've got three different peaks here um, with a ratio of two to three to three, which is likely to mean a CH2 and two CH3s likely to be, okay? So it's given us a little bit of information. We're not certain, but we're starting with something at least, okay? So the peak at 4.1, that's the one far over there on the left. Let's bring the mouse in. So there it is. So this one here, um, this has a value of 2. Okay, so this this integration trace. So this suggests that it is a CH2. So we've got two hydrogens in this environment. Um, and if we use the data table that you've seen um, on your data sheet, we can actually suggest that it's this type of structure here. Okay, so there's our hydrogen. And we know that this carbon will have two hydrogens here. So there must be something else bonded here that's not hydrogen. Um, and this is actually right next door to an oxygen with a C dual bond O. So this is turning out to be an ester, isn't it? Straight away. Okay. So let's carry on. There we are. Okay. So the splitting pattern is a quartet. So what that's telling us, remember, if we're using the N plus one rule, a quartet is telling us that there must be a carbon right next door to this CH2 group, and that carbon has three hydrogens itself, okay? So this is gonna be, well, it can't be on this side because we know there's an oxygen there, so it must be here. We must have a CH3 or something there on this right-hand side because these two hydrogens here are adjacent to that CH3 because of the splitting pattern that we've, that we've just seen. Okay, so the peak at 2.1, let's just go through, look at the other peaks as well. So the peak at 2.1 has a value of 3. So this suggests it is a CH3 group. Um, and using the data table suggests it's actually this structure. So what we're seeing here is a CH3 here bonded to a C double bond O. Well, we know a C double bond O exists from this bit here. Okay, so there it is. So we think that this CH3 replacing this R group that's what that it doesn't mean it's really important with NMR it doesn't mean that you have this molecule and that one it doesn't mean that at all NMR is just shown as little bits of this image it's a bit like getting a picture and we're seeing we've got one picture and we're seeing different sides of this picture so this CH3 here is bonded to a carbonyl group but we know we have a carbonyl group of this so this CH3 group is going to be where that R is there we don't have two carbonyl groups here okay very important and even the formula tells us that as well so we're just seeing a different side of the picture here so the splitting pattern here is a singlet so this suggests the ch3 is next door to a carbon with no hydrogens um in this case that's true because you can see here that this is next door to a carbon but it doesn't have any hydrogens it's just got oxygen on it so that's definitely right so that fits that pattern there okay 
So let's have a look at the final peak. So that's the peak at 1.2. It has a value of 3, suggests that it's a CH3 group. Um, and we're using the data table, suggests that it's an RCH3. So next door to that CH3, we have an alkyl group. Um, it's a triplet peak. So this means it's next door to a CH2, okay, which we already know about here. So that's our CH2 here. So this is likely to be next door here. So the CH3 that's causing this peak here is likely to be um, this over here okay so finally what we can do is then put all that together and we can work out our structure which is there so there's our red that's that peak there our purple one which is the peak at the end and then the yellow one sorry the yellowy green one sorry which is the one at the end at uh, the end there so you can see work your way backwards look at your structure does it match the nmr spectrum in this case yes of course it does okay so there's a lot of information there to do with NMR. It's just practice, practice, practice. Look for it and just keep practicing. It's the only way you're going to improve with NMR. It's really difficult to, um, you know, to explain. Obviously, I can point out all these different things. That doesn't automatically mean you can then jump um, and do any NMR spectrum and analyze it and break it down. You have to just keep practicing. You will make mistakes. Um, it wouldn't be normal if you weren't making mistakes at these. You know, it's just about taking your time, being methodical, drawing down your structures. Okay. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to move on to the last sections of this video, which is looking at chromatography, because that's another part, another part of um, analysis, so chemical analysis. So here we're going to use thin layer chromatography, which you will have seen bits of this in the um, uh, um, uh, amino acids, proteins, and DNA uh, video as well. So you would have seen this here. So don't worry if you're thinking, hang on, have I seen this already? You will have done. Okay, so that was specifically designed for... Um, amino acids. So I'm going to go through this for those who haven't seen this video as well because it kind of appears in both topics. So thin layer chromatography is really good for separating and identifying compounds, mainly good for separating really. But TLC um, is a really loving, uh, tender loving care. Um, so it's a really loving uh, type of chromatography. So thin layer chromatography, it uses a stationary phase which is silica um, and this is mounted on a glass or metal plate as you can see there so there's our plate there okay and then what we do is we draw a pencil line towards the bottom and we put drops of our mixture that we want to separate or or identify on the actual line that we the pencil line that we've just drawn on okay so um, what we do is we place that plate into a solvent and the baseline must be above the solvent line remember um, if you've done paper chromatography you might have done that um, you'll see that if you put your solvent line or solvent above that line, these substances here will just dissolve in the solvent and it just doesn't work. So very important, it must be below that. So we leave it until that solvent has migrated near the top of the plate and we mark that as the solvent front, okay? And we allow it to dry and we'll look at the analysis of that later on. So it works really simply. Just by that solvent migrating up, it dissolves the spots that we can see on there, the spots of chemical that we want to test. Okay, so it dissolves into the water, um, and some of the chemicals in the mixture um, will dissolve, or they will dissolve in that substance in the in the solvent that migrates up. But some of them solvents will actually spend more time bonded to the stationary phase, that's the metal plate here, than they will in the mobile phase. So actually, what you'll find is the spots that adhere to the stationary phase more will kind of at the end of the um, chromatogram will end up spending time here. The ones that have migrated further up are somewhere at the top here. Okay, so that just depends on obviously what we're, um, you know, what what we're testing here. So the ones which dissolve really well will find some will find themselves near the top of the chromatogram. So and we can identify the chemicals using the positions on the chromatogram as well. Okay. So just like um, just like we've seen in the DNA one, if our samples are coloured, then that's fine. We can identify them spots. Okay, but if they're colourless we can't actually see them spots what we need to do is use iodine or fluorescent dyes or uv light to do this and a classic example is amino acids as you've seen if you have seen the other video you would have seen this bit anyway but for those who haven't um basically we use a dye to try and highlight the spots that we've that we've created and then we can then measure them and work out an rf value which we'll look at later but one of the ones is using fluorescent dye and uv light so if we add a fluorescent dye to that plate the chromatogram plate that we've just removed we can actually see some of the spots by using a uv light 
Um, now, what happens is the whole chromatogram plate is dyed, and that will show up on the UV light, but the spots won't. Okay, so um, the um, the spots or whatever we're testing it here, like for example, an amino acid, um, this will block any glow from the fluorescent dye. So what we can see is something like this. So we get a chromatogram with some um, colorless spots and there's some white spots, which um, is actually the spots that we've separated out there, the chemicals that we separated out, but the whole plate is then dyed and obviously that shows it was purple as you can see on there. So another way is using iodine, as I've said before. So iodine um, is, you might have seen iodine as, as gray crystals. Um, and what we do for iodine is we place the chromatogram in a sealed jar with some iodine crystals tucked away at the bottom there. Um, and then the iodine vapor starts to vaporize. Okay, so remember it sublimes. Iodine at room temperature doesn't go to a liquid. It goes straight to a gas, so it sublimes. Um, and... Um, it sticks to the um, spots on the paper and it's effectively the other way around as you can see there so you can see we've got our jar um, there's our jar there there it is and we've got our iodine in the bottom it's vaporizing and we're getting highlighting the spots here so it's just the opposite way around to this there okay so iodine vapor is known as a locating agent effectively it's locating the spots on the on the paper Okay, so now once we've identified the spots, obviously this is only relevant if your substances are colorless because you can't see them, they're invisible on the paper. But once we know where the spots are, we can then calculate their RF values. And RF value is then used to identify our substance. Okay, um, so the number of spots on the plate basically tell us how many chemicals make up that mixture. Okay, now in this example, and I'll show it up in a moment, um, we're, we're going to simplify it by showing one spot, but you may have... Um, three or four spots on the same in the same row so that tells us that we have three or four different substances in our initial initial mixture so the chemicals these can be identified by calculating the rf value and comparing these with a library of known values that you that you'll have access to okay you've got to be careful with that because you've it is dependent on certain criteria which we'll look at in a moment but basically the rf value um, um is calculated by um, so look there you go distance traveled by the spot divided by the distance traveled by the solvent so you can see here um, if I just bring the mouse over here we've got our solvent line our baseline sorry that we started with and our solvent has risen to this line at the top here okay we've got the distance traveled by the spot which is the red arrow there it is and you see we've simplified this you might have a few spots down here as well but we've just taken one and the distance traveled by the solvent and basically we do this the red line divided by the purple line okay and then we get our um rf value as a as a result of that okay okay so okay so let's just bring the mouse back in okay so the rf values this is why i said you've got to be really careful with this the rf values are fixed for each chemical so that's great because it means we can then hopefully identify it however that is only true if the temperature, say the data book would have run this experiment, or somebody would have run the experiment in the data book, and it would specify the solvent that was used, the makeup of the TLC plate, and the temperature that that it was conducted in. Now, if yours deviates away from that, you can't compare it. You must be exactly the same conditions as what the data book is saying. So you can see there, um, you've got to be really careful with obviously the you know the, the conditions that we're conducting that in and if they are the same conditions we can compare our rf values and identify the substance okay <coughs> right excuse me so um let's look at um column chromatography so it's another type of chromatography you may have done this um at school or college um, but column chromatography is actually ideal for separate for separating and purifying larger quantities of mixture. Obviously, the TLC plate is only doing it for small samples. This is much better for larger amounts if you want to separate them out. So, um, like I say, TLC is useful for small quantities. It can't be used for larger ones. So we use this column chromatography instead. And um, it's a little bit like, well, it is. It's a burette that's actually used here. Um, or we can use another glass column, depending on the volume of liquid that we're using, of course. Um, and basically, it's packed. The column is absolutely jam-packed with silica or, um, or, or alumina beads, which are what we call the stationary phase. This is the phase that's obviously not moving. Okay, so it's fixed in that column. And you can see in that column there. So the mixture or the solvent, which is the mobile phase, that's the bit that's moving, is running through this column um, and the solvent is continuously running through. We're mo constantly moving solvent through that 
um, through the column there. So let's have a look at the diagram and see what we've got here. So we've got um, different compounds obviously as we run it through the top of the column there. Some compounds will spend a lot of time in the stationary phase. It might actually take a while to come through. So we pour our mixture through at the top there. Okay, and what we'll get is different bands. So some substances in that mixture will spend more time in the stationary phase and will take longer to run through the column. Substances will, some substances will take a lot shorter length of time and actually spend more time dissolved in the solvents, that's the mobile phase, and actually appear down here. Um, and obviously this one here. And then what we can do is when we run through this, um, when we run through this column, we can effectively collect that layer first in a beaker. And then once we've collected that, we can then swap another beaker in, collect the second layer, and then swap it again to collect the last layer, which is the third one at the top there. So effectively we're separating our substances, but we know we're getting purer substances. We're not getting a mixture anymore because the column has helped us to separate out our mixture of chemicals into individual, into the constituent components. Okay, so then looking towards the last and um, the last part of uh, chromatography, um, and so this is gas chromatography, also known as GC. So gas chromatography is really useful to separate a mixture of liquids that are volatile and hence can be identified. Okay, so this is great for volatile substances, unlike the other two that we've seen here. So you can see we've got a different chromatography setup depending on the chemicals that we're using. So it looks a little bit like this. Now, you won't see one of these, I doubt it anyway, in school or, or college. These are really reserved for universities because they're incredibly expensive bits of kit and used at research quite a lot. And so a GC um, has a really thin column that's wound tightly up inside an oven, which is this bit here, as you can see uh, there. So there's our really thin column. It's like fishing wire. It's really thin. Um, and it's lined, that wire inside that line, inside that wire, it's lined with a solid or viscous liquid. So it could be something like oil. Um, and that obviously acts as the stationary phase. So the sample's injected into the machine um, and is carried by an inert carrier gas. So that could be something like nitrogen or argon, for example. So nitrogen is, is used probably more, most commonly. Um, and um, that is the mobile phase. So that's moving everything through this column. Okay, so each substance takes a different amount of time to travel through the column. I think you've kind of seen a bit of a trend here, um, just like with your column chromatography. Um, each substance takes a different amount of time to come through this column here. Um, some will spend more time stuck to the stationary phase on the inside of the column. Some will actually spend less time in the stationary phase and more in the mobile phase and whiz through this column and out to the other side. And the length of time it takes to travel through that column is called the retention time. So it's the length of time it takes to go through the column. Now, the time it takes for the um, the sample to travel through varies because, like I say, it depends on how many um, some molecules will spend will adhere to the stationary phase um, much more readily. Some molecules will spend more time in the mobile phase; they're quite soluble, so they'll be carried through by that gas. Um, so obviously, that depends on the um, you know the type of chemicals that we are, and hence it's separating them out. So we get different substances coming out at different times, and effectively they're detected on the spectrum there. So let's have a look at that spectrum. So um, the GC spectra gives us some peaks and the peaks are varying sizes um, and the peaks appear at different times as you can see there. So the each peak, like I say, represents a different substance. So you can see here in this spectrum in particular, we have three different substances in our mixture. Okay, And each of them substances comes through the column at a different time, which is why they appear at different parts on the spectra. Now what we can do is we can compare the retention times of these with a library of known retention times and that can help us to identify the constituent components of our mixture that we put in in the first place. So the area under the peak, so that's the, obviously the area under each of them peaks, tells us the amount of substance we have. So whichever chemical came out at, at this retention time, we've got the most of in our mixture. This one we've got the least amount of. So... <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so gas chromatography is actually really useful. Like I say, it's mainly used in research, but um, it's used in um, um, breathalyzers, for example. So you might have these, well, you will have them in police stations. Um, so you'll have them, um, obviously they'll have a handheld one, and then they have a, um, a machine where you can actually detect the levels of alcohol in the blood or in the breath, should I say, so you can do a blood test or a breath test. Um, and that is gas chromatography effectively. It's trying to detect how much 
alcohols in the breath okay um, and also um, it can be used um, in urine and blood um, and it can be used in court as evidence for um, you know for um, you know, how, how much a person was over the drink drive limit or the drug drive limit they could use drugs as well um, and obviously use blood blood samples for that blood tests to see how much is in there um, and so gas chromatography as well can also be used by um, um, art historians when they're restoring work they can actually identify the types of paints each paint depending on when it was painted will have a different composition and um, because technology's moved on or the might, painter might use a particular style um, and so um, it's useful for that because if we can identify the pigments in that paint we could possibly date the painting as well because we you know um, paint certain paints were used at different eras so it was useful for that as well Okay, so just coming on to the final the final part of this video, which is actually combining these spectral techniques together. So we're going to look at something called GCMS. Now, GCMS is where we combine gas chromatography with mass spectrometry, we come, which you've seen in year one. Um, and we combine them together and help us identify a mixture of different substances. So actually really powerful. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, so... Um, Mass spectrometry is better suited to identifying unknown compounds, okay? So um, we use their, remember we use their mass to charge ratio, the MZ ratio, when we're analyzing a mixture of compounds, um, and this can um, often produce um, a confusing spectrum. So if we put in, say, a mixture of five different substances in a GC, uh, sorry, in a mass spectrometer, an MS machine, then we get all the peaks for all five of them and that's just really confusing all at once so um thankfully um we can use gas chromatography as we've seen before it's really good at separating out these individual um chemicals in the mixture um, and so we separate them out now once we've separated them out um we can then um obviously we can then use the um, mass spectrometer the benefits of the mass spectrometer to identify our individual substances so um what happens in practice is we get, um, you put your sample into the gas chromatography first, which separates them into the different components. So let's imagine there's three different chemicals in that mixture. So then what happens is the mass spectrometer will then take each one one by one and will produce three separate um, spectrums. So one for each um, um, chemical that made up our original mixture. So um, like I say, it's fed through the GC machine separates it out and then um, it goes straight into the mass spectrometer after that. So the substance then can be positively identified using that mass spectra that we've just produced there. We compare it, um, a lot of these um, bits of kit have a library, digitally stored library of, of, um, of spectra um, and that means we can then literally directly compare it with a, a digital a digital source and that makes it really efficient because it means you don't have to then go and search for it in an old-fashioned book these are um digitally stored spectra um stored you know online online in the cloud or you know somewhere like that okay so really really powerful type uh, really powerful mixture there Okay, that's it. So that's everything on organic synthesis, NMR chromatography. Make sure you memorize and you go through all of your organic synthesis, synthetic roots. Very important. NMR, make sure you know about splitting patterns, neighboring carbons, etc. And chromatography, there's an extra on there, which is mainly column, gas, and how you can combine it with mass spec as well. Um, there's a full range of these videos on Allery Chemistry YouTube channel. There's whiteboard tutorials and there's exam past paper walkthroughs as well. Um, they're all for free. All I ask is you hit the subscribe button, please. Um, and also, these, these are PowerPoint slides that I've made. Um, you can download them using the link. Great value for money. You can purchase them there. Click on the link in the description box. Really good for on the move. And you can even print them off. I know people who print them off and use it to then um, obviously revised from in, in connection with the other stuff as well um but that's it okay bye bye